Hey, one more time, why don't we give it up for our high school band for leading us this morning, for our middle school ushers. We have middle school ushers, we have people in the tech booth, it's really awesome to see. What we're really seeing is not the church of tomorrow, what we're seeing is the church of today. And I hope that you get a glimpse of that this morning, of what this generation can be. It really is the church of now. And I'm so excited about that. Also, I don't know if I introduced myself to you yet. My name is Robbie. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm actually the middle school pastor. And I've been here for over 13 years now. And I'm tied with Pastor Barry for the longest standing pastor here at Christ Church. And uh, in fact, <laughs> Pastor Barry and I started on the exact same day. And we always joke about who showed up to work the earliest. And, uh, but yeah, 13 years. And uh, been working with middle school students for those 13 years. But I got to tell you, one of the things I've learned while working, with, uh, working here at the church is that middle school students are characters. Right? I like, if you've been around a middle, school char- a middle school student, you will say the same thing. They can be a character, right? And I know as a church, we've been talking about the Old Testament characters and, uh, and some of their lives for the past couple months here at the church. But I don't think it holds anything until a middle school kid. Because, I mean, we've had some kids pass through our programs where you're like, who are you? I mean, they, they're, they're, they can be wild. They can be crazy. They can be loud. They can be serious. They could be an introvert and extrovert all at the same time. I don't even know how that's possible, right? I mean, just middle school kids are such characters. And uh, so many times I ask them, what were you thinking? And they'd go, uh, I don't know. Exactly, you were thinking, right? I mean, if you have had a middle school kid, you can say the same thing, right? That's just who they are. They are characters. And uh, one of the things now I'm really learning is I do think they are characters. But as a parent of a two-year-old, I'm learning they can be characters as well. I mean, if you ever had a two-year-old, they can be very much a character as well. And uh, sometimes in my house, I'm wondering what is going on. I mean, my child, Hannah, she's, she's wonderful, and she can be such a sweetest little girl. I mean, she can love on her sister and be kind to her neighbors. But the wind blows, and the next day we're thinking we need to cast demons out of her. We, I mean, literally, call up the elders of the church. Let's pray for my daughter. What's happened to her, Right. I mean, it's just amazing to me how they're just a ball of emotions, the two-year-olds are, and uh, what a trip it is as a parent with a two-year-old, you know? And uh, so just a couple months ago, my wife had a dinner with some of her friends, and so it just left me with my daughter, Hannah. And so I planned a little daddy dinner we were going to go to. We were going to BRGR up in Cranberry. And uh, before we went that evening, um, I decided we needed to change clothes. We needed to look a little bit more presentable. Well, I put on my negotiation skills and walked into the room and uh, tried to negotiate with my two-year-old to get out of the outfit she was wearing. And on and behold, I lost the deal. I lost the battle, right? And I just gave in. And uh, so we showed up at this nice restaurant, and she was wearing her tennis shoes. She was wearing some sweatpants. She was wearing this princess dress over those sweatpants and some other accessories as well, right? And... uh, it made her happy, so I gave in. I said, all right, as long as we're going to have a good dinner together, and sure enough, we were. We were sitting there having our hamburger, sharing our french fries, and it was just such a pleasant evening with the two-year-old. It was, it was really wonderful. And uh, as I'm sitting there at the end of the meal, this thought stuck into my head. Because I didn't tell you this, is that she was also sitting there wearing her little crown. And as I'm sitting there talking with her, the thought came in my head, like I said, and it was this. This little princess of mine is one day going to be a queen. This little princess, daddy's little girl, is one day, she's going to be, grow up to be a queen. And I thought, and that stuck with me, and I thought for our church and for our ministries, what if our vision was this? That every kid that walked in these doors, despite their background, despite their, their mistakes, despite whatever obstacle may be in the way, that one day they will be kings and queens for the kingdom. Right? That despite where they come from, despite their age, one day they will be kings and queens for the kingdom. And my little girl, one day, my hope and prayer is that she will do exactly that. She'll be a king, and a, she'll be, you know, she's not gonna be king, she's gonna be a queen for the kingdom, right? And, you know, yesterday was the uh, royal wedding, and there was a lot of hoopla that happened yesterday. Maybe you watched it, a lot of big deals. But can I tell you, the big hoopla should be taking place? What's happening right now downstairs? Because listen, as, those, as our church is changing diapers down there, as our congregants are, they're not just changing diapers of somebody. No, they're, ch- they're changing diapers of children of the king. 
right? And as you volunteer with the children's ministry or middle school ministry, what the privilege is is that you get to serve not nobodies. You get to serve children of the king, the Lord of lords and the host of hosts. These are his kids, and we get the privilege to invest in them. We get the privilege to serve them and change those dirty diapers. And that's glorious, right? Or stinky at the same time. But here's the deal. For us to raise a generation that's going to be for the kingdom, there's a couple of things I really believe has to happen. And the first is this, that we need to help them recognize their purpose and their potential. I think so many times we overlook this generation. We generalize and we throw terms out like they're lazy, they're distracted, they're busy, or they're always like this. You know, talking about on their cell phones, right? Like we generalize the, the generation and say, this is what they're going to be. We overlook their potential and their purpose. You know, it's interesting when we look at the life of David. He was actually overlooked. As we read in the scripture focus this morning, uh, Samuel comes to Jesse's house looking for the next king. And where was David? Out in the fields. See, I think his own father didn't see his potential. His own father thought he was probably too young to be king. As David... um, is about to face Goliath, right? He sits down and he's talking with, Paul, with Saul, the king at the time. And King Saul's telling him, says, David, you can't do that because why? You're just a boy. You can't face Goliath. You're just a boy, David. And even as David goes on to face Goliath, Goliath repeats that same phrase in the scriptures. He says, you're just a boy. Now, when you hear that on the surface, that sounds okay, but when you really consider it, You're just a boy? What they're really saying is you're too weak. You're a little crazy because you're too young. You don't know what you're doing. You're inexperienced. You can't take on Goliath because you're just a boy. But that's not what God was saying, was it? No, you're called to be king. And in fact, actually three times David was anointed king. Anointed king of Judah and king of Israel. And in this scripture as well. So three times He was anointed king. See, God was reaffirming in David this call. That, listen, when the world may call you a boy, God is calling you to be king. When the world may say you are inadequate, you're too weak, you can't do this, God would say, no, 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 I'm calling you to be king. See, our generation needs to hear that from us. This younger generation needs to know that they have potential and they have purpose. Uh, One of my good friends in high school is a fantastic, gifted communicator. Unbelievable skills and talents. I mean, just unbelievable what God has done in his life and how he's able to preach and communicate. Unbelievable. And in fact, just uh, a couple weeks ago, he was at Joel Osteen's church in Houston where he spoke to 40,000 people on stage. And just, I'm telling you, as his friend, I was like blown away. So many came to know Jesus that day. It was unbelievable to see. Uh, This summer, he spoke at Hillsong Hillsong Church in Australia at their um, pastor's conference where he shared to like 30,000 pastors and uh, church workers. And you see this guy and you go, man, he's so talented. He's so gifted. But if I was to take you back to high school (laughs) and some of the stories I could share with you, you'd be like, these two guys aren't the same. There's no way that it's the same person. Some of the jokes and the stuff I could talk about that he didn't, he didn't know what he was going to do with his life. And he, I mean, there are times you just didn't, he didn't care about anybody. I mean, the guy in high school and the guy he is now, you go, how'd that happen? Well, I know part of his story, and it took a small group leader. It took a youth pastor who was able to help him along the way. They believed in him. They inspired him. They challenged him. They helped him see that he was gifted and talented and to become the man he is now. It took a youth pastor. It took a small group leader to see his potential. You know, in David's story, one of the cool things I learned while studying this week, check this out, that the first person to recognize David's potential wasn't his father. It wasn't King Saul. It wasn't the prophet Samuel. It wasn't his brothers, but check this out. The first person to see in David the potential was a servant. 
And check out what the servant had to say. 1 Samuel 16, 18. And this is before, check this out, this is before David defeats Goliath and becomes popular. This is what the servant had to say. He said, I see a brave man. I see a warrior. I see that the Lord is with him. Listen, when you see a boy, I see a brave man. When you see a boy, I see a warrior. See, I see that the Lord is with him. See, I think the lesson is this, that when you get the privilege to serve this next generation, whether that's in the nursery downstairs, whether that was toddlers, infants, middle school, high school students, this is it. When you get to serve, and when you get your hands dirty, you begin to see that they have unbelievable potential. Unbelievable potential. They need to know. They need to know, and they have to hear it from us. Also, they need to know a greater purpose. You know, I had a dad, I remember a dad one time, who felt like his, just, his, his daughter was making a horrible mistake. She, she decided to date this guy, and he, he pretty much, the dad said this, he's like, he's just a loser. And he was distraught because he was like, I raised my daughter better than this. And why is she like dating this guy? She's so much better for him, right? And so, so this father is just bewildered with this. And so he, he, he looks for some counsel, and he goes to find some help. And this is the advice that he received. Your daughter needs a greater purpose. So he took that advice and he, he thought about it for a moment and, and did some research and came up with this plan. He decided to move his family or, or take his family on a trip to Mexico where he found this small little village. And in this village, he, he exposed him to the poverty that was taking place, to the lack of clean water and all that was taking place in this village. And at the end of the trip, he gathered his family together and he said this. He says, I think as a family... We could change this place. Would you join me? Will you jump in on this idea that we as a family could change this place? And by the end of the trip, everybody said yes. And what I love about this story is that two months later, guess what? She dumps that loser. And the dad goes to his daughter and going like, I'm really glad you did this, but why? And here's where her words, right? You ready for this? These were her words. She says, I don't got time for that. Dad, I I don't got time for that. Why? Because she has now a purpose. And that's our hope and our prayer is that our young people will realize that they have such a purpose that they don't got time for that. They don't got time for the drama. They don't got time for partying. They don't got time for this guy or that guy. No, they got a purpose. And it's the kingdom to live for God and his calling. So may we raise our kids that they know their purpose and that they know their potential. Amen? Amen. Not only that, they need to be empowered by the Spirit. 1 Samuel verse 13. After David is anointed king here, we find that the Spirit of the Lord comes down upon David in power. In power. See, as David faces Goliath, it's not in his own strength. And it's not his own abilities or his smarts. No, no, no. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. That today we celebrate Pentecost. That God sends his Holy Spirit to empower the believer. And that's what we all need here today. That's what we all need. And I'd like for you to consider Peter. We know him as the denier. We know that when it was time to be quiet, he would speak. We know that when it was time to speak, he would be quiet. When it was time to stand, he would run. When it was time to get up and go, Peter would stay. That's what Peter was. I mean, he just constantly got it wrong when you study his life. But on the day of Pentecost, doesn't it change? I mean, on the day of Pentecost, here Peter, he stands up in front of a crowd... And he gives this amazing sermon, and many come to know Jesus. And you go, what happened to this guy? I mean, he couldn't stand for Christ to one woman who asked. But now he stands in front of a crowd and gives this amazing sermon, the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe here this morning you have some Goliaths 
in your life, can I tell you by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you are filled up, you can defeat them. And they may have been bragging in your face for the longest time. And the power of the Holy Spirit will give you victory. Will give you victory. You know, time and time again, I tell my middle school kids, they need the church. I'll tell you the same thing. You need the church. And what I'll explain to them is there's no other place where you'll hear God's word. There's no other place where you'll gather in your life normally for worship. And there's no other place you'll be filled up with the Holy Spirit. They need the church. And so do you. And I love it because on Sunday nights in our high school ministry, just as you saw this worship band lead, our kids are being filled up. Just as I take kids to summer camp, I love it. I'll take a kid that doesn't know anything about Jesus. And his life will be changed at summer camp and he'll be filled up, ready to face the Goliaths of today. Why? Because the Holy Spirit moves in his life. Our kids have so many Goliaths. The culture they're growing up in, so many things pulling at them. So many obstacles in the way. But with the Holy Spirit, those Goliaths will fall. They will fall. Our kids need the Holy Spirit just as we do, just as we do. We also need to help them understand what real success is. We need to affirm what true biblical success looks like. And let me explain this. I was leading a small group of boys a couple years ago. In a typical small group, you ask you know, some generic questions. And one of the questions we were talking about is, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? Have you thought about it? And I got a lot of the typical answers, a businessman, one guy wanted to be a, a firefighter, and I was like, those are all great careers. And, and then I asked one kid, and he, he was, I liked his answer, he's like, I want to be a lawyer. And I was like, I'll play along. All right, wh- why do you want to be a lawyer? And he said, well, I like to argue with my mom, so I might as well do that for a living. I was like, well, that's clever. That's good. I got that. Then I asked another kid, and like I said, middle school kids could be characters, and they're could be blunt and they could be so honest. But this one kid, check out, this is what he said. He said, Robbie, I just want to be rich. That's what he said. He said, Robbie, I just want to be rich. And I laughed and giggled and I thought, that's okay, that's honest. But there's some truth there. And what he was really saying was that's his definition of success, isn't it? As long as that he obtains whatever rich is when he grows up, he'll have so-called success. See, our culture is going to teach our kids that's the way. Our culture is going to teach them that fancy cars and fancy homes means success. Fame, power, wealth, right? This is what success is. If I get that dream job or that degree, that will mean I've made it successful. There's also the phrase, the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. See, these are the messages that this generation is going to hear unless we tell them otherwise. I think it's interesting that Samuel, the prophet who goes to Jesse's home, he even had a worldly point of view. He goes to the home of Jesse looking for the next king, and he sees Elab, the oldest son. And he sees this son of Jesse's, and he's like, surely this is the king, right? I mean, he's strong, he's handsome. Oh, look at his appearance. Man, this guy must be it. But God had to correct this prophet of God. And he tells them this great verse that, God, that the man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Like, like Samuel, you, you got it wrong. You think success is based on the outward appearance? No, no, success is with the heart. God had to correct him in his thinking. You know, even as a parent, I think we can be misled in this, in our own thinking, our own parenting. Like I said, I have a two-year-old, and she is full of energy. And if I was to invite you over to my, my house sometime, or if you were to occasionally stop by, I'm telling you, you'd walk into my house going like, what in the world's going on here? I mean, she has so much energy, and she loves to run. I mean, she'll be doing laps around her house. You'd be like, what is going on like a dog doing laps around her house? It's just crazy. She just loves to run. And uh, I was thinking, you know, as a dad, I see her doing her running, and I go, you know what? She has a little talent here. We can go places with this girl. I mean, she may be a future track star. And it's so interesting as parents, we could, you know, start dreaming for our kids. 
and seeing something in them that's maybe not there. I mean, she's only two, and I think she's going to be a future track star. I mean, where does that come from? Well, I think it comes from sometimes we get the wrong definition of what success is. And I think someone's story that can help me, help me illustrate what I'm really talking about is Tiger Woods. And I'm not going to harp on him because he's human, but I think his story we all kind of know and we can relate to. I mean, Tiger was an unbelievable golfer at such a young age. I don't know if you've ever seen videos of him, but as a young boy, I mean, he could drive the, the golf ball. I mean, it was just unbelievable how far he could, how good he was and how far he could hit the golf ball. It was just unbelievable at such a young age. And we see that his dad pushed him and pushed him and got him into, I mean, he was in golf schools. He was on, you know, uh, he had a personal coach. I mean, it was just his parents poured everything they could into him. And, and we know that he came out as an amazing golfer, one of the best that ever played, right? Won so many tournaments. And we know that the world would say Tiger had success, right? Like he, he, he was famous. He was rich. He, 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 he was just an amazing golfer. But very quickly, we learned of his character. Very quickly, we learned on the other side of the coin that, that Tiger's life was a mess. Divorce, multiple affairs, substance abuse. See, very quickly we realized, very quickly realized he had little character. That his parents poured everything into his golf career and they left little for his character. See, that path in life does little to build character, doesn't it? And this is the dilemma we face with as a church. And I think today there are many new religions and they look different than they were in the past. Someone's academic, academically, I can't even say that right, <laughs> school, right? But I think one of the new religions today, is, check this out, is youth athletics. We used to say maybe Sundays are reserved for football, but now I'm telling you the new religion of today for our society is youth athletics. And let's think about this for a second. It's crazy to me. At 12 years old, it seems like kids have to turn pro, right? Like they got to choose one sport that they play year around. Not only are they playing it year-round, they can't miss practice. And if they do, they face severe consequences. There's no date of the calendar. There's off-limits. There's no day of the week that they can't be played. Even, check this out, last week, Mother's Day, for instance, I had students that showed up to church already played. I had students going after Mother's Day to practice. During the year, on Wednesday nights, after program, I have kids that have games at 10 o'clock at night on a school night. There's no day that's off limits. It's the new religion. They even start them young. I was driving through Pittsburgh the other day and I saw an advertisement for a soccer camp. Great. Soccer camp for two and three year olds. Two and three. Right? It's just crazy. And what the point is I'm making is, are we going to sacrifice our kids on the altar of sports? Are we going to gamble with their character in hopes of a college degree, college scholarship? Are we going to gamble with their character for hopes of this career? And hopefully they'll be successful. See, to me, and what I believe is a biblical point of view, to me, real success is when our kids do what God's called them to. That's what I want for my daughters that they would do what God has called them to. So I tell them, if they want to be a missionary, you be a missionary. If you want to go work in an orphanage overseas, go do it. Do what God has called you to do. And as a great reminder, Paul says, what good is it for a man to gain the world if he forfeits his soul? So what's your definition of success? Is it the right biblical one? Because if it's not, we'll parent in a way that we really won't have true success. Not only that, parents and grandparents here, our generation still needs your presence. Your parental presence is so needed. And I get with middle school students and high school students, it's a whole new ball game. I mean, before when you're in elementary, remember the elementary years, you're just wanted and loved and said, welcome into my life. That's what they do, right? They just love to have you there, love to be with you. And I get when it comes to middle school years and high school years, they're like doing the Heisman, right? 
you get stiff-armed. And, and it feels so different. But I'm still telling you this, and the research continues to say the same thing, that parents are still the greatest influence in a student's life. They need your presence. They need your wisdom. They need your instruction. They need your guidance through this all. You're so needed, Mom and Dad. You're so needed, Grandma and Grandpa. You're so needed. See, when I look at David's dad, Jesse, it leads me to ask this question. Jesse, are you present in David's life? Are you, are you present there? I mean, think about it. Samuel shows up to find the next king, right? Jesse leaves David out in the field. And I wonder, Jesse, did you even have conversations with your son? Did you know about his true character and his heart and who he really was? And if you did, why'd you leave him out in the field? And, and then think about this. A um, great example of this is, is, is David is about to face Goliath, and he has this conversation with Saul. Saul tells him, you're just a boy, David. You, you can't go face Goliath. And do you remember what David replied was? He said, listen, <laughs> I defeated a lion, and I defeated the bear. With God's help, I defeated both of those things with my bare hands. Now, if you're a dad and you hear that about your son, I'm telling you, you're walking around like, my son is the man, right? He defeated a lion and he defeated a bear, a bear with his hands. It's just unbelievable. Dads would be proud about this. I'm not sure we see that in Jesse as I look at the scriptures. I go, Jesse, why didn't you know this about your son? And I'm thinking this. He was present, but not truly present. Like he's in his story and he's in his life, but he's really not there. Like my, my wife gets on to me about this all the time. We could be at the dinner table and having dinner, but I'm really not at the dinner table. I'm really thinking about work. You know, I could be giving my kids a bath at night and uh, right there with them and everything else, but I'm in social media world somewhere else. See, this generation needs us to be present when we're present. Because I don't think we're going to look back at the end of our days and go, you know what? I wish I would have worked more. I wish I would have taken more business trips. I wish I would have taken more dinners out with my, with my friends. No, what I really think is we're going to look back and regret not being present, not being in their lives. I think we're going to regret that. And one of the things I know is true is that there are only going to be 16 once, and they're only going to be 12 once, and they're only going to be two once. So let us not miss it. Let us not miss this key, vital time in a student's life, in a child's life. Let us not miss it. So here's what I think we may have to start doing. Ready for this? That we may have to start saying no to some good things so we can say yes to something better. We say no to some good things so we can say yes to greater things. And that's our little ones. Amen, church? Hey, as the band is ready, you guys are good, you're here? Just a couple of things to help us remember what I'm talking about this morning. Is that we recognize their purpose, their potential. We put them in a position that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Empowered. We need kids empowered by the Holy Spirit to face their Goliaths. They can't do it in their own strength and they can't do it in their own abilities. They need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We as a church have to affirm what real success looks like today. Not wealth, not riches, not fame. And they need you and I. They need our presence in their lives. And we do this so that we can reap kids like David. That's what their acronym is. It's REAP. It's a biblical principle. You sow, sow away in a way that you will reap something. So my hope and my prayer, listen, church, is that we sow in such a way that we reap kids with the heart like David. That although he made his mistakes, even though he made his, made his, lost his way along the path, he still had the heart for God. May we sow in such a way that our kids will be kings and queens not for fame, money, or wealth, but kings and queens for the kingdom. For the kingdom. That little two-year-old of mine will one day be a queen. 
And how are we going to get her there? What path is she going to take? Who's going to be that influence? Who's going to help guide her? I hope you'll join me in being that person in her life.